Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar on using trout crops to control crucifer flea beetle by George Parker of the ETA. My name is Alice Formiga, and I'm the webinar coordinator for eOrganic. eOrganic is the organic agriculture community of practice with eExtension. You can find all of our published articles, videos, and our many upcoming and recorded webinars on organic farming and research topics on our website at extension.org slash organic underscore production. A PDF handout of the slides for this webinar is available, and I put um, a link on your screen to where you can find it, and I also put a direct link in the chat box, and I'll be putting that in the chat box again in just a moment after Joyce gets started. Um, before we begin, I'd like to just give you a quick rundown on how today's webinar will work. The presentation will last about 45 minutes, and then after that, we'll have an additional 30 minutes for your questions. We are very excited to be hosting Joyce Parker today as our speaker. Here's a picture. Um, Joyce is an entomologist with a background in agroecology and sustainable agriculture. She received her MS in Ag Biology from New Mexico State University and her PhD in Entomology from Washington State University. Her doctoral research explored organic pest management strategies that enhance pest control and improve crop yield. Currently, Joyce is an AAAS Science Policy Fellow at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency in the Design for Environment branch. So with that, um, Joyce, I'll be handing over the screen controls to you. So um, just a second. Okay, here we go. So you should be able to have okay. it now. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you to everyone for attending. So I will be discussing some of the graduate research I performed at Washington State University under the supervision of Dr. Bill Snyder. So crucifer flea beetles, and I'll be referring to crucifer flea beetles as CFB or flea beetles, is a common pest throughout North America. And they attack plants in the family Brassicaceae. So these are plants in the cabbage family. And they include broccoli, kale, cabbage, bok choy, collards, and arugula. If you've grown brassica crops, you've probably seen these flea beetles before. Both the larval and adult stages of flea beetles have chewing mouth parts, but it's the adult stage that causes the most damage, and I'll get a little bit more into this in the next few slides. So flea beetles are highly mobile, hence the name flea beetles. They can jump great distances, and they have enlarged legs that allow them to do this. So control tactics are kind of difficult because they're so mobile. Adult flea beetles search for host plants using both visual as well as olfactory smell chemical cues. So here are a couple pictures of flea beetles. The left picture flea beetles on a broccoli leaf. Um, you can see the damage they cause. And the right picture are flea beetles that have just destroyed a pok choy leaf. This is the life cycle of a flea beetle. It has both a below and above ground life cycle. So adult flea beetles deposit eggs in the soil at the base of their host plants. Larvae hatch from these eggs and feed on below ground portions of the plant, such as root and root hairs. However, this doesn't cause the damage. Again, it's the adult feeding on the plant that causes the most damage. So when the days get warmer, usually mid to late spring, adults will emerge from the soil to feed on above ground foliage. They overwinter when the days get cold again in protective plant debris, and this usually includes leaf litter, grassy field borders, and ditch banks. So depending on your location, flea beetles can have one to multiple generations. In the Washington and Idaho area, flea beetles have one generation. However, locations in warmer temperatures allow for more flea beetle generations to be completed. So damage to plant roots and root hairs caused by the larvae does cause some problems. It can cause a reduction in the size and health of the plant, but this doesn't cause significant economic loss. On the other hand, adult flea beetle feeding can slow the growth of plants, scars foliage, decreases marketable yields, and can kill small plants and transplants, sometimes leading to total crop loss. This picture down here on the bottom left shows flea beetle damage to mustard leaves, and this is the typical shot hole damage it creates. On, and it happens more, you'll see the shot holes more on thinner leaves like mustard. On thicker, waxier leaves like a broccoli leaf, the damage appears as pitting. 
Since flea beetles move into fields from surrounding habitats, this really complicates in-field control efforts. Current control options for organic farms include using floating row covers, which can block access to the crop. Um, also, if a pest insect gets underneath the row cover, it can reproduce without interruption from a predator. Um, another option are using organic approved chemical control, but some of these can kill your beneficial insects. So we looked at another option, which was trap cropping. A trap crop is a stand of plants grown that attract pest insects away from your target crop or cash crop. In this case, our target crop in our experiments was broccoli. And this picture right here shows severe damage on broccoli. And this was taken at a local organic farm in Idaho at the end of the field season. And this is an extreme case, but flea beetle damage can be a severe problem. And in some instances, growers have completely left brassica crops out of rotation. So a trap crop lures flea beetles away from the target crop. It's been recommended for a trap crop to be successful that the trap crop should be 10% of the crop area used or even more. Since the trap crop is consumed and damaged by the plant, it is usually unmarketable. Once flea beetles start to feed on the trap crop, you can kill them with different methods, like a botanically based insecticide or by tilling the infested trap crop into the ground. In one experiment, we also used a flamer, which was just also fun. It's important to note, however, that trap crops may not provide complete protection, especially during heavy pest infestations. Pest behavior and its di distribution in the field can also impact the success of a trap crop. And I will get into this in the next slide. So the shape of a trap crop can influence pest control. For example, a perimeter trap crop, which you see right here in the upper right, um, kind of creates a border that can, or a barrier that can prevent the pest insect from moving further into the crop. Here's another version. Here we have a strip crap, trap crop planted along one side of the field. These are two pictures on the left from actual farms implementing a trap crop to control flea beetles. Both used mustard. Here on the bottom, we have mustard flanked on both sides by the target crop broccoli. And up on the top picture, we have a trap crop next to one row of the cash crop broccoli. And this brings us to species diversity. So implementing a trap crop introduces species diversity into a farm. And species diversity influences ecosystem function. For example, diverse habitats provide a greater diversity of prey and host species, which often results in more stable populations of predators and parasitoids. This often leads to decreased pest problems in diverse habitats, and why we see more pest problems in simple habitats. Pimentel 1961 stated, considerable evidence in the literature suggests that the lack of species diversity like we see in this picture above, modified by cultivation, may be responsible for the outbreaks which are so typical of these simplified communities. On a similar note, Altieri stated, the key is to identify the type of biodiversity that is desirable to maintain or enhance ecological services and to determine the best practices to encourage the desired biodiversity component. So we see a simple environment compared to a diverse agroecosystem. However, this requires quite a detailed understanding of biodiversity effects. So this leads us to wonder if different species complement one another, and can we apply this to trap crops? So biodiversity's ecological benefits can be harnessed to alleviate pest problems in agriculture. However, it remains particularly challenging to attempt to reverse the effects of species loss by restoring interspecific complementarity and other specific ecological benefits of biodiversity. Some of the clearest progress on this has come from work in agricultural systems, particularly from work in organic farming, which can conserve species and improve biodiversity by reducing chemical pesticides and incorporating various control strategies like trap cropping. 
Here's a picture of a diverse trap crop used to control flea beetles. And you can see the different types of plants we have planted here. This leads us to our main questions. Can we modify farming practices to capture these biodiversity benefits? So while a trap crop serves to diversify plantings at the farm scale, it remains unclear whether diversity within the trap crop itself could further improve the effectiveness of this technique. So does species biodiversity within the trap crop improve pest control? And we also looked at if there's an optimal trap crop distance, and I'll get into that at the end of the presentation. So our main objective for our experiments that were conducted over several years in Washington and Idaho were to investigate the use of simple and diverse trap crops as a tool for managing the Crucifer flea beetle. So we know biodiversity influences ecosystem function, and we wanted to see if we could apply this to trap crops. Diverse trap crops contain plants with different chemical profiles, different physical structures, and different phenologies that might be more attractive to the crucifer flea beetle. So now we're getting into our experimental design. So the crucifer flea beetle is a ubiquitous pest both east and west of the Cascade Mountains, so we had two plot locations, one east in Moscow, Idaho, where the summers are typically warm and dry, and one west of the Cascade Mountains in Mount Vernon, Washington, where the summers are typically cool and wet. We had a simple trap crop treatment, which consisted of five monocultures of our trap crop species, and we had diverse trap crop treatments, which consisted of five unique treatment combinations of four species. Our trap crop species were chosen based on grower recommendation and literature, and they included yellow rocket, Pacific Gold Mustard, Dwarf S6 Rape, Green Glaze Collard, and Pak Choy. So back to our question of do different trap crop species complement one another? We chose these species because they could possibly complement one, one another. Uh, they have a mixture of chemical profiles. So the chemical component crucifer flea beetles are attracted to in brassica plants are known as glucosinolates and the plants we chose have different primary glucosinolates. So Pacific Gold Mustard's primary glucosinolate is known as Sinegrin, and the rape has different concentrations of primary glucosinolates. They also have different physical structures. For example, the collard had glossy leaves versus the rape, which had hairy leaves. They also all had different phenologies. We notice rape to mature later in the field season than all of the other plants. So again, this was our trap crop treatment. We had five monocultures of each of our trap crop species for our simple trap crops. And for our diverse trap crops, we followed a substituted design and made five unique treatment combinations of four species. So here, the color represent the plant that is missing. For example, in our minus yellow rocket plant treatment, we're missing our yellow rocket plant. So we planted these plants, but the density remained the same. So whether it was a simple trap crop or a diverse trap crop, the amount of plant planted was the same. We also randomized this in the field. This is not how they were planted in the field. This is the physical layout. We had four rows of our broccoli, our target crop, flanked on both sides by our different trap crop treatments. And this is what it looked like later on in the field season. So here again, we have four rows of our target crop broccoli flanked on both sides by our different trap crop treatments. And this blank area here represents our control plots where we had bare ground and no trap crop. So for our methods, we first planted our trap crop because you want that trap crop to be in the ground first and be attractive and established for the pest insect. We then transplanted our broccoli we sampled flea beetle populations in the trap crop throughout the season using a DVAC suction sampler, and there I am doing that. And a DVAC is essentially a lawnmower engine that's been oops, reverse engineered to suck. We then recorded visual observations of flea beetles on broccoli, and at the end of the season, we recorded broccoli whole plant dry weight. 
So the results of our diversity experiment from 2009 showed us a few important things. First, we found that diverse trap crops were important, but it depended on the season. So diverse trap crops were more effective early in the season than our east location. In our west location, diverse trap crops were more effective mid-season. More importantly, though, we found that certain monocultures were more effective than others. So these monocultures attracted more flea beetles, and these included monocultures of Pacific Gold Mustard, Pak Choy, and Rape. So what, we took what we learned in 2009, and we expanded on this diversity experiment, where we used our top three most attractive trap crop species. Again, we varied diversity, but density remained the same. And we kept our same plot locations. We have our east location in Moscow, Idaho, and our west location in Vernon. For our simple trap crop treatments, again, we had three monocultures of each of our trap crop species. <clears throat> For our diverse trap crop treatments, this time we followed two different schemes. We had a low diversity scheme and a high diversity scheme. Our low diversity scheme consisted of three unique treatment combinations of two species, and our high diversity scheme consisted of one treatment combination of all three species. So again, for our simple trap crop treatments, we made three monocultures of each of our trap crop species. For our low diversity trap crop treatment, we followed a substituted design and made every possible pair out of a pool of three species. So here in our minus mustard treatment, we're missing our mustard plant. And for our high diversity treatment, we made one combination of all three species. We followed the same physical layout. We had four rows of our target crop of broccoli flanked on both sides by our different trap crop treatments. And again, our control plots consisted of bare ground, no trap crop. Our methods stayed the same. We planted our trap crops first, made sure they were established before we transplanted our broccoli. We then sampled flea beetle populations in the trap crop using a DVAC suction sampler. We recorded visual observations of flea beetles on broccoli. And then at the end of the season, we recorded broccoli whole plant dry weight. So on to our results. So this represents some of the observational data we saw throughout the season. Here we have our diverse trap crops, pak choy, rape, and mustard, and you can see they're just covered in flea beetle damage. And here is our broccoli, our target crop, with little to no damage. And just to show you how close they are, here again is our pak choy, one of our diverse trap crops, covered in flea beetle damage. Our target crop of broccoli 23 inches away with little to no damage. So here we're looking at broccoli whole plant dry weight, and this is from the broccoli we harvested at the end of the season. Our x-axis is our trap crop species composition. We have zero, which represents our control, where we had zero trap crops. Trap crops with one species, so these are our monocultures our diverse trap crop with two species, and our diverse trap crop with three species. Our y-axis is our dry weight in grams. The open circles are our east location, and the closed circles are our west location. And we found that broccoli adjacent to our diverse trap crops containing all three species attained the greatest dry weight, and this occurred at both locations. So we also measured biodiversity effects. Diverse communities can outperform those that are species poor, either because they bring together species that complement one another, so this would be complementarity, or because they include particular species with strong impacts, and this is known as species identity effects. Complementarity is most clearly indicated when the impact of diverse communities exceeds that of even the single species that has the greatest effect on the responsive interests. In our case, the responsive interest is broccoli yield and flea beetle density. And this is known as overyielding. We quantified overyielding 
using the metric DMAX, which is commonly used to analyze the results of biodiversity ecosystem function experiments. So in our experiment, crop protection is improved when the DMAX value for broccoli yield is positive. So here we're looking at the DMAX broccoli, broccoli yield for its whole plant dry weight. So when the DMAX value for broccoli is positive, it indicates that broccoli plants were larger near our diverse trap crops than our simple trap crops. When 95% confidence intervals around the mean of our DMAX value did not overlap with zero, we considered this to be evidence of a statistically significant biodiversity emergent effect. This means that our high diversity trap crop was effective because of species complementarity and not due to species identity effects. Interestingly though, our DMAX was not significantly different from zero for our two species polyculture. This suggests that complementarity was only fully realized when all three highly effective trap crop species co-occurred. So now we're looking at flea beetles in our trap crop and broccoli. So we'll start with panel A. These are the flea beetles we de out of our trap crop. Our x-axis, again, is our trap crop species number. We have zero for our controls, trap crops with one species, trap crops with two species, and trap crops with all three species are high diverse. Our y-axis is the log 10 mean flea beetles per plot. And as before, <clears throat> flea beetles attained higher densities in trap crops than bare ground, and this is what we would expect. Although flea beetle densities did not differ between high and low diversity trap crop plantings. And this is not totally unexpected because we did use the top three most effective trap crop species in this experiment from what we learned in 2009. However, when we look at panel B, flea beetles and broccoli, so these are the flea beetles we recorded on broccoli, we see an interesting trend. Flea beetles' densities were significantly affected by the presence of both low diversity and high diversity trap crop. We see this trend increase as diversity on flea beetles increases. So when we increase the number of trap crop species, we also see an increase in the number of flea beetles on adjacent broccoli. And this is counterintuitive since we also found that broccoli adjacent to the diverse trap crops containing all three species to have the greatest dry weight. So in summary, when it comes to trap crop species number and broccoli protection, zero trap crop species is equivalent to one and two species, but three species provided the most effective trap crop mixture. Therefore, biodiversity within trap crop enhanced function, but only when the trap crops were composed of the right type of diversity all three trap crop species. So in conclusion for these two experiments, species complementarity is often caused by balancing resource use by different resource extractors. In our experiment, our diverse trap crop represented different resources flea beetles can utilize in order to feed, develop, and re reproduce. For example, we had trap crops with different chemical profiles, different physical structures, and different phenologies. And all of this has an important role in the herbivore-plant interaction. However, the specific mechanisms still remain unknown. Remember, we found more flea beetles in our diverse three trap crops, but we also found more flea beetles on broccoli adjacent to that. So we have to take a little bit closer look at pest behavior. And we did that two different ways. So we looked at trap crop proximity and flea beetle removal. And our objective here was to further improve flea beetle control by exploring how close the trap crop needs to be to the, bro to the broccoli, the proximity. We wanted to see if we could reduce some of this overspilling that might be happening overspilling of our flea beetles and our trap crop into our broccoli because our trap crop was perhaps planted too close. 
we also wanted to see what flea beetle removal, how, how that would improve trap crop effectiveness. So does spraying the trap crop with the pesticide improve control? So we conducted this experiment in 2011. We kept our same plot locations, one east in Moscow, Idaho, and one west in Mount Vernon, Washington. This time we kept our diverse track crop of all three species, that's the only one we used, with Pacific Gold Mustard, Pak Choi, and Rape. To test trap crop proximity, we planted broccoli at three different distances away from our trap crop. We had a near distance where broccoli was planted 0.5 meters away from our trap crop, a middle distance where broccoli was planted 4 meters away, and a far distance where broccoli was planted 11 meters away. Our spraying trap crop, so we had two treatments. We sprayed and we didn't spray with a pyrethroid insecticide. Um, we realized this is or an organic focus experiment and we did use a conventional insecticide to make sure our flea beetles were profoundly dead. We only had one field season to get this conducted. We also had a control that consisted of no trap crops. So this is the physical layout. We had four rows of our diverse trap crop, and you can see all the different plants. You can see the mustard, the pak choy, and the rape. And then we had our different broccoli distances. Here, 0.5 meters away is our near. Four meters away is our middle. And then 11 meters away from our trap crop is our far broccoli. And this is another view. Here again, you can see our diverse trap crop, our near broccoli, our middle broccoli, and then our far broccoli. Our methods stayed the same. We planted our trap crop first and made sure it was established before we transplanted our broccoli. We then applied an insecticide, a pyrethroid, to half of the trap crop plots. So half were sprayed, half were not sprayed. The half that were sprayed were sprayed twice during the field season. We then sampled flea beetle populations in the trap crop using a DVAC suction sampler again. We recorded visual observations of flea beetles on broccoli. And then at the end of the season, we recorded broccoli whole plant dry weight. So on to our results. Here we are looking at flea beetles in our trap crop. So these are the flea beetles we devacked out of our different trap crop treatments. Our x-axis is our trap crop species number. Zero stands for our control where we had no trap crop. We had our diverse trap crop that was sprayed. Three stands for the three species. And then our diverse trap crop that was not sprayed. Our y-axis is the log 10 mean flea beetles per plot. Panel A is our west site, and panel B is our east site. So in panel A, our west site, we always had lower flea beetle numbers compared to our east site. We collected 10 times the number of flea beetles in our east location that year. And as expected, we collected significantly fewer flea beetles out of our control plots where there was no trap crop. We also collected significantly fewer flea beetles in our trap crop that was sprayed than our trap crop that was not sprayed. So in our controls, where we had only bare ground, we found very few flea beetles. When we had a trap crop present, we found significantly more flea beetles. And when we killed flea beetles by spraying them with an insecticide, we saw significantly fewer flea beetles in that trap crop. So now we're looking at broccoli yield. So this is the broccoli whole plant dry weight, and this is from the broccoli we harvested at the end of the season. Again, our x-axis is our trap crop species number. We have our controls, our diverse trap crop that was sprayed, and our diverse trap crop that was not sprayed. Our y-axis is our broccoli whole plant dry weight in grams. Panel A is our west site, and panel B is our east site we found that broccoli planted in the presence of a trap crop attained the greatest dry weight. And this occurred at both locations. 
We also found no effect of distance on broccoli yield. So we would, after seeing this, we would expect to see a decrease in the numbers of flea beetles found in broccoli adjacent to our track crops and an increase in the number of flea beetles found in broccoli adjacent to our controls where there was no track crop, it was just bare ground. But when we look at the number of flea beetles in broccoli, we actually don't see this at all. So despite causing strong and clear differences in broccoli yield, track cropping had surprisingly little consistent effect on where flea beetles were found on the broccoli crop. So here we're looking at flea beetles on broccoli. Our x-axis again is trap crop species number. We have our controls where there is no trap crop, our diverse trap crop that was sprayed, and our diverse trap crop that was not sprayed. Our y-axis is the log 10 mean flea beetles per plot. Panel A is our west site and panel B is our east site. And at our low pest density site in the west, flea beetles were found at the edge of the broccoli crop regardless of whether a trap crop was present or sprayed. Patterns were quite a bit different at our high density eastern site. Here flea beetles were more evenly distributed across all situations except for one. When the trap crop was not sprayed, flea beetle densities fell in adjacent broccoli. So our data suggests three important things about flea beetle behavior. First, when densities of flea beetles are low, they concentrate at the edge of the crop and move further into the crop as densities increase. Second, flea beetles are not necessarily feeding heavily on the plants which they're found on. So we found more flea beetles on broccoli adjacent to our diverse trap crops, but that broccoli also weighed the most. And then finally, spraying flea beetles in the trap crop did not necessarily improve broccoli whole plant dry weight. Which gets us to our conclusion. So our diverse trap crop was highly effective, but altogether our research suggests that flea beetles are regularly moving. We know they're highly mobile and they're moving between the trap crop and the broccoli, but when given a choice, they will do most of their feeding on the trap crop. And apparently because of this movement, the trap crop still protected the broccoli without changing the apparent densities of flea beetles on the broccoli crop. So even though we were finding flea beetles on the broccoli, they were actually feeding more on the track crop. And again, just to emphasize that, here we have our one of our diverse track crops, pak choy, covered in flea beetle damage, our broccoli 23 inches away with little to no damage, where you can see that they chose to feed more heavily on the pak choy. So for our grand conclusions, trap crop biodiversity improved flea beetle control. However, this highlights the important role that pest behavior can play in determining whether a crop diversi diversification scheme succeeds or fails. So remember, we were still finding flea beetles on our broccoli. And it is growing increasingly clear that providing greater crop diversity at the scale of entire landscapes can decrease pest numbers while increasing the impacts of natural enemies. In our study, we improve crop protection through diversity manipulation on a much finer scale, that of a particular trap, comp, trap crop planting. And it's noteworthy that diversity at this smaller scale can be easily manipulated by a single farmer, which is something much more difficult to do at the landscape level. And I unmuted better than I had planned, <laughs> so we have more time for questions. Um, I'd like to thank you all for attending. Um, I'd also like to thank E-Extension, E-Organics, and our funding source for all of this research, Western Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education. Well, thank you, Joyce. Um, we're about to begin our question and answer session. And for anybody who missed the beginning of the presentation, um, you can use the question box on your screen to type in questions and hit return. 
And if you don't see the question box, just click the small plus sign next to the word question and that will open it up. Um, I also wanted to mention that we really value your feedback, so we'd very much appreciate it if you could fill out our follow-up survey, which you'll be receiving in an email later today. And again, this webinar is being recorded and you'll be able to find it on our website within the coming week. And if after the webinar you have additional questions about organic farming, you're very welcome to use the um, e-extension Ask an Expert service. So luckily, we do have quite a few questions coming in and we have a little extra time to answer them. So um, hopefully we'll get some great questions. I know we already have some, so um, feel free to ask more and I'll do as many as I possibly can. So um, the first question is um, whether diatomaceous earth um, can control the underground phase of these beetles. Um, it possibly, it might also be more effective to use diatomaceous earth maybe in um, in combination with maybe an entomopathogenic nematode. I know um, some farmers I was working with in Idaho were looking at that. I'm not exactly sure how successful it was, but that might be a combination to try. Um, you have to know where the larvae are also, so um, if you have... Um, post plants, if you have mustard or brassicas in that location, you can definitely try that and see if it makes a difference. Okay, um, you mentioned tilling in the trap crop. Um, does tilling in work with flea beetles? That's been, so we personally didn't till ours in, but that has been in the literature as an effective way to get rid of flea beetles in the trap crop. Of course, you, you never really know if they are dead, which is why we used an insecticide to make sure they were profoundly dead, because you don't want to have that uh, source. Okay, um, this was a question that came up when you were discussing different um, trap crop species, and um, whether you can generalize um, that a more tender brassica trap crop should be used to lure in the adult flea beetles, like some of the ones with thinner leaves, whether those were in general more effective than those with um, thicker leaves? Um, not necessarily, because we found pak choy kind of had glossier, thicker leaves, and, and that's why we used the combination. So we, we looked at these plants as single species, and we looked at them as two species planted together, and then three species planted together, and the three species planted together worked the best because they all kind of complemented one each other. Um, the mustard did have thinner leaves, um, but and it had a different chemical profile, but it also matured faster than the rape, which matured later, so the rape maturing later possibly provided a more attractive trap crop throughout the entire season. Um, if we picked just one plant species and we did that when we were doing some farm trials, we did choose the mustard because it was uh, more affordable. It also always, it was just, it was easier to plant. It would create a really thick, heavy stand. Okay, yeah. If that answered. Okay, yeah. yeah, I was wondering about affordability too in terms of... Um... Yeah, the um, mustard seeds are fairly or very affordable and um, very easy to plant. You just scatter them on the ground and they would grow. Okay. Um, so when did you sow the mustard at, at the um, Mount Vernon site? Let's see. Um, so we did this 2009, 2010, and 2011. And each year it, the, it got later and later in the season because the season was just colder. But I believe the first year we did in 2009, it was late April, and then um, the following year, it was two weeks later, and the following year, two weeks later after that. So by 2011, we sowed the mustard in mid-April. So it, it depends on the weather. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's that's a good answer. So, um, okay, yeah. So here's another question about, I know you said um, you didn't use a certified organic insecticide, but what would be the most effective certified organic um flea beetle pesticide control to use after um, the crucifer flea beetles are trapped? Py Pyganic is a uh, organic approved pesticide. So it's a pyrethrin and we used a pyrethroid, which is the synthetic version. Mm -hmm. And that would probably be the most effective uh, botanically organic approved pesticide. Okay, great. Um, 
Let's see, um, why not plant species that attract flea beetle predators? There are actually not many flea beetle predators. There is one uh, parasitoid wasp, Microvidite, but it's not, it's common, but it never occurs in large enough populations to um, reduce large, pet, large outbreaks of flea beetles. Um, the flea beetles are also very mobile, but just incre increasing habitat biodiversity increases beneficial insects. So bringing in more uh, beneficials also would help with aphids, which were a problem when we planted brassicas. Okay, here's a, another question about um, economics. Do you have any idea of profits versus loss benefits when using that much trap crop seed in an organic setting? We didn't look at that, and um, it has, like I mentioned earlier, it has been recommended to use at least 10% or more of the crop area used for track crop, and obviously you're going to be taking out um, room for crop production, so um, it's definitely a balance. Okay. Um, let's see, um, this person noticed that um, in your test plots, um, between rows are clear of any cover crops, so they're bare ground between the trap crops and the broccoli. Um, have you tested any cover crops between rows versus bare ground between rows? And um, so, okay. oh, keep, no, keep going. Sorry. <laughs> okay, yeah, there's a second part of the question, but I'll wait till after you answered that part. Oh, um, we'll go with the second question because it might go along with what I was going to answer. Okay. Well, um, the second part was any comments on black plastic on. Um, CFB population. On what plastic? On the uh, crucifer flea beetle population. Oh. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. So for the first answer, first question, um, we, we did look at companion plants. We looked at intercropping different companion plants in the broccoli to create a push-pull system to push flea beetles out of the broccoli and pull them toward the trap crop. And we looked at um, Yukon gold potatoes, green onions, dill, marigold. So we wanted to use plants um, organic farmers were already growing in the area to ecologically engineer the farm to be more pest suppressive. And um, in those particular studies, we actually didn't find a difference in any of the companion plants we used. We didn't find a difference that um, the trap crop was more effective or the broccoli yield improved when it was planted with any of those companion plants. Now, we didn't look at uh, cover crops, but um, that is a really good experiment because flea beetles use visual and olfactory cues. So it's possible using a cover crop um, can mask the broccoli more. And then I don't have an answer for the second question. Okay, the black plastic. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, okay um, this farmer is in Colorado, and he was wondering if you've ever used wood ash for flea beetle control. No, no, I have not. Um, I do know there is a really good Colorado State University fact sheet on flea beetles, um, Christopher flea beetles in Colorado. Um, I don't remember if that talks about wood ash or not, though. Okay. Um, let's see. If you wanted to grow a mustard, such as arugula, um, in the production crop, um, would you recommend different trap crops or repeat the same um, that you use? Do you think um, trap crops would be effective for arugula, which are also definitely a magnet for... <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think it depends. I think it would be really interesting to try and see if this diverse trap crop worked well. Would work with arugula. It worked well with broccoli, just because these trap crops um, were definitely more attractive than the broccoli. So I, so you, you can't necessarily say it would work well for the arugula because arugula is very attractive, but it is a good option to try in addition to other control techniques. Okay, um, so this person's checking. Um, that, did you say that at an 11 meter distance, trap cropping was effective? We found no difference on distance to broccoli yield. So even the broccoli planted 11 meters away from our trap crop still um, still weighed as much as those planted near. 
Um, and, and that also is a delicate balance because you don't want the broccoli too close to the trap because of that overspilling effect. But what we were finding was even though they were overspilling into the broccoli, um, they were moving back and forth. They were really active. And when they would move, they would feed more heavily on the trap crop. So they just, they preferred to feed on the trap crop. Okay, um, here's some questions about um, flea beetles. Um, will other types of flea beetles attack brassicas and will the crucifer flea beetle attack other plant families or are they very specific? So they are oligophagous. So that means they are specific. So the crucifer flea beetle will feed on all crucifer plants. But there are also solanaceous flea beetles, like the potato and tomato flea beetle, which will feed on solanaceous plants. So the crucifer flea beetle will not feed on solanaceous plants and vice versa. Um, there is a really good fact sheet on eorganics that will soon to come out on flea beetles and organic control, and it discusses the different types of flea beetles. So they are oligophagous and specific to the families of plants they eat. Yeah, we'll be announcing that in our newsletter, so you'll be notified when that comes out. Um, should be in a couple weeks or so. Um, let's see, do you have any comments on the use of surround on um, crucifer flea beetles? I do not. Um, that is an interesting question, though. I'd like to know the answer. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Um, do you have any insights on where um, the adult flea beetles are depositing their eggs? Um, do many um, crucifer flea beetles make it through their life cycle? They do, and they um, they deposit the eggs at the base of their host plant, so it'll be at the base of these brassica plants. I didn't look to see at how many um, didn't wouldn't survive um, the season. I do remember one year in western Washington they had a severe flood so we were thinking that might have impacted flea beetle numbers the next year, but sure enough, there were still just as many flea beetles. So they're, they're resilient insects. Um, did you have any trouble getting the trap crops established before you planted the, crash, the cash crop? Not with the plants we use. So um, we did grow the green glaze collard and the pok choy. We grew those in the greenhouse as seedlings first and then transplanted them. The rape and the Pacific Gold mustard, we direct seeded them. Um, I highly recommend the Pacific Gold mustard as if you're using just one trap crop, that was um, really easy to grow, always produced a heavy, thick stand, um, and it was very affordable. Okay, um, were the trap crops direct seeded or transplanted? So some of them, the Pacific Gold Mustard and the Rape were direct seeded, and um, the others were hand transplanted, grown in the greenhouse first. Okay, and um, how many days before the um, transplant of the broccoli? Oh, oh, I don't remember off the top of my head, but we waited for uh, the, because you want, in general, when you're doing a trap crop, you want the trap crop to be uh, established and attractive. Um, so as long as it's there and large enough for the pests to see it and feed on it and be attractive, um, then I would transplant the, the target crop. But always have that trap crop out first. Okay. Um, did you experiment with crop rotation at all? Like um, what was in rotation before the broccoli? Um, so in our field experiments, it was mostly wheat, just on the areas of the research farms we were working with, so we did not look at what was grown before. But I do know um, some farmers do use crop rotation as a management strategy. I don't, I think the most common management strategy on organic farms are uh, row covers though for flea beetles. Okay, um, here's a comment that Pyganic is too expensive for a small farmer. It, it is. <laughs> okay, so is there any other products you might recommend? That's the one off the top of my head as a botanical pesticide I know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, okay. Um, here's a question about, again, back to arugula. What do you think would happen if you had a trap crop around the arugula that was covered with row cover? Um, 
So it, that's an interesting situation because you one thing you have to worry about, a trap crop may bring them in. So um, if your plant is covered, your target crop is covered with a row cover and you have trap crop near it, you'll definitely have flea beetles there feeding on the trap crop. Um, so hopefully they don't get under the row cover because that's one of the issues with row covers. The pest can feed and breed without interruption from predators or anything else. So it's a balance between whether um, you, you are you bringing them in or are they already there? I, I don't know the answer to that. But that's something to keep in mind. Yeah, um, in kind of a related question, um, someone asked, are you creating a great environment for a flea beetle population explosion? That is a great question. Um, so for our experiment, they were already there. I, I can't really say, like, we don't really know how far the trap crop is pulling them in. Um, but trap crops have been used for uh, years as a management strategy. And it also um, it introduces biodiversity into your farm. So hopefully it's not creating a giant source, especially if you're able to kill them. Um, here's a question about whether flea beetles are non-native species. They are not native. They're originally from Asia. Hmm. They have been in the U.S. for, I think, over 100 years now. I think they were introduced early 1900s. Oh, okay. Early 1900s. Okay. I believe so. I, for some reason, 1914 is sticking out in my mind. Huh. <laughs> um, let's see. Do you have any comparison of the effectiveness of floating row covers versus trap crops? Unfortunately, I don't. Um, I, I know a lot of the small farms we worked with would use floating row covers. Okay. Um, but, but these were small, and it depends the scale. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, here's a question about whether the economics might benefit from using closely planted but harvestable interplantings of attractive marketable crops that are sprayed, which could include bok choy, Siberian kale, and mustard. So that would be a trap crop that's sprayed? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it would work, but the problem with the trap crop is it usually has so much feeding on it that it is unmarkable. So if so, if, if you're spraying it enough and it doesn't, then, yeah, that, that could be a benefit, an economic benefit. Okay, here's a comment from a farmer who's used wool as a mulch and has found it helpful um, in an oh. observational but not a controlled experiment on eggplant. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> That would be a solanaceous flea beetle. Yeah. Okay. Thanks it's for real. sharing that. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Here's a comment that says flea beetles migrate to the edge of fields. So what do you think would happen if you planted a trap crop at the edge of a field? See, um, and this is where the design of the trap crop comes in handy. So if you have a perimeter trap crop, it kind of creates this barrier around your uh, your target crop. And one thing we found is if the flea beetle densities were low, the flea beetles tended to stay at the edge of the field. So that trap crop, that perimeter trap crop might be more effective. But when densities increased, they, they moved further into the field. Okay. Um, let's see. Did you fertilize the trap crop? And if so, what did you use? We did fertilize the beginning of the season, um, and we had a company come out and do it. I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, they did a soil fertility test to see what was needed. Okay, um, let's see. Does the trap crop that was direct seeded grow in pretty much any climate or area of the country? Um, I imagine it does. One thing, though, once it gets warmer, it um, must the brassicas will bolt. So that was something to keep in mind. Also, um, one thing I should mention is once the plants flower, that glucosinolate, so the chemical flea beetles are attracted to, gets you know more concentrated in the seeds. And we want the plants, the trap crops, to stay lush and green. So we constantly remove the flowers and seeds just so the 
plant would stay um, lush and healthy. So we had to constantly kind of mow the mustard. Okay, um, let's see, it's, it's um, uh, another farmer shows sometimes that rotation does not liberate space for um, a pre-plant of a trap crop. So at how young of an age will a trap crop generate sufficient plant chemicals to attract the crucifer flea beetle? Uh, we were finding flea beetles on very young mustard, um, that Pacific Gold mustard um, and rape, they produced a really thick stand. And I remember finding flea beetles um, on very young plants. Okay, um, let's see, did you look at successional planting of your trap crops? Um, were the trap crops equally effect, effect, attractive through their development? No, and this is one of the benefits of using diverse trap crops. The rape matured later in the field season than the pak choy and the mustard, so this provided more of a successional trap crop, so a more effective trap crop for the entire season. We didn't look at successional, but that is a good way to ensure uh, effective trap crop throughout the season. Okay, um, let's see, Have there been, has there been research that you know of dealing with cucumber beetles with trap crops? Um, I, I can't say off the top of my head. I do know um, there is an e-organic article um, by Bill Snyder, my PhD advisor on cucumber beetles. I don't remember if they looked at trap crops or not though. Yeah, I will um, try and find the time here to stick that um, <laughs> into the chat box here, that article I know I sent someone won on um, squash bugs already, but um, let's see if we have a long answer to a question, I can search for that and find it um, for those who are interested. Um, and also, uh, let's see, let me find a question here. Um, did you see any impact of the trap crops on other crucifer pests, such as aphids, caterpillars, or cabbage maggot? No, we didn't. Um... There were a lot of aphids on our broccoli. We didn't look at that. When, we did look at diamondback moth populations because that tends to be um, quite a significant pest in the Pacific Northwest, and we did not notice a difference for uh, our different diverse trap crops and um, diamondback moth populations because our diamondback moth populations those years were extremely low. Okay, I'm just putting the um, cucumber beetle article in the chat box here, um, and then we'll get on to the next question. Okay, let's see. Will um, the crucifer um, flea beetle overwinter in the soil and emerge under row covers in spring and summer? So they typically overwinter in not in your field crop, but in the um, in leaf litter, so debris and ditch banks, kind of the outer of the field. And, okay. and that's for the crucifer flea beetle. It can vary for different types of flea beetles. Okay, um, here's a question about whether you or other um, in the Northwest, um, I know you're not in the Northwest now, but uh, <laughs> you were, um, tried um, spinosad or entrust, which is widely used by organic growers in New England for flea beetles. We did not look at that. Um, Ruth Hazard out of University of Massachusetts might have might have some research on that. It sounds familiar. We personally did not, though. Okay, yeah, we got another comment um, that also says that spinosad is supposed to work better than pygamic. Um, the comment says pygamic works best on cool days when the beetles are slow moving. Um, Let's see. Are you still there, Joyce? I yes. Oh, okay, I yeah. Okay, good. The sound cut out for just a second there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, yeah, someone else heard that it's an effective pesticide, but it's also expensive. Yes. Um, so let's see. Um, if you have healthy broccoli starts, um, it's this comment says um, that they usually outcompete flea beetles um, without a trap crop. Um, have you found that as well? I think that can be the case. I think it depends how, um, how, what the density of flea beetles are, because I've definitely seen adult, not adult, but, um, very mature broccoli have severe flea beetle damage. 
and it, I, so I think it depends on um, the year and the pest numbers, but that definitely can happen. You can definitely have broccoli outgrow the damage if it's not severe. Okay, here's someone in Western Oregon, and she said that um, spinosad worked effectively for them on um, collards and kale with um, the flea beetle infestation that they had. So um, thanks for that comment. Um, let's see, do you need to plant two trap crops, one for the beneficials and one for the pests? Um, or in general, I guess we had um, another question about like, you know, I, I know you said there aren't very many um, beneficial predators of um, crucifer flea beetles, but are there any and um, is there anything that would attract them? There is one um, parasitoid microvidite that is native and found to um, parasitize flea beetles. I, in general, enhancing farms with uh, ne insectary plants um, would be a benefit. It, they never occur in large enough populations to cause significant differences in the number of flea beetles out there, but um, it, it never hurts to attract more beneficials. Okay, um, here's a question. Uh, here's, no, here's a comment from one of um, the participants in Joyce's on farm study, and she said that um, we continue to use trap cropping for flea beetles on our farm and using different types of mustard as a catch crop with success. As a participant in Joyce's on farm study, we were very pleased with the success. So that's Aww, a nice comment. Hey, that's very pass. great to hear. <laughs> yeah, I'll pass on your name to <laughs> Joyce after the cover. So um, that's nice. Um, let's see, um, we've gotten to that one. Okay, um, you talked a little bit about cover crops, um, but um, what about the idea of living mulches for pest management? Do you have any comments on that? No, I don't, but I do know um, Saruti Hooks out of University of Maryland has done a lot of interesting work um, in Hawaii using these living mulches and brassicas. Um, so I know there's some extension fact sheets on that. Um, again, it camouflages where the trap crop is, or I mean, excuse me, where the target crop is. Flea beetles do use visual cues so that it's a good way to kind of mask the target crop. But they also use olfactory cues. And that's one reason we were looking at using companion plants. And we had plants like onions, just kind of smelly plants, marigolds, dill, to see if we could mask some of that broccoli. Um, let's see, how do you think your experiment would work to control, I'm not sure if I pronounce this right, but Bagada bug or Bagrada hilaris? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> right. um, let's see. Um, do you have any other trap crop suggestions other than the one that you mentioned? Oh, there's a lot of trap crop research out there, um, depending on what you are looking at. Are they looking to control flea beetles in brassicas? I'm not sure. Um, so, so for all of the plants we used, the they were successful at trapping flea beetles. They were also um, they also provided different benefits. Um, I know the Pacific Gold Mustard, once tilled into the ground, also was kind of a nice green manure. In general, the Pacific Gold Mustard um, was bred with a high glucosinolate concentrate and can be used as a green manure when tilled into the ground to kill um, weed seeds and uh, other soil pests like nematodes, plant parasitic nematodes. So the, so the plants have different, they serve different purposes too. I know we had a, a webinar on using trap crops for um, brown marmorated stink bugs, so um, you might want to check our archive um, in case you're interested in learning about that. Um, it was a, by uh, Russell Mizell, um, I believe of the University of Florida. So um, we're going to be having a lot of webinars on insect controls over the course of, uh, insect controller management over the course of the season. So. Um, yeah, I definitely encourage you to join us for those. I'm just checking through the questions here to um, see if there are any that have not been answered. So let's see, um, just hang on here. 
Okay, what about bunching green onions, dill, and marigolds are a few examples of companion crops that have been used for flea beetle management. Do you have any comments on those? Yeah, so um, those are three we actually use in some of our experiments, and we, um, I mean, they produced well, but we did not find that planting them with the broccoli enhanced the effectiveness of the trap crop. It also didn't improve broccoli yield. So in our particular experiment, it wasn't an effective companion plant in the fact that it didn't um, make the trap crop work better. So um, do you think that trap cropping is more a way of controlling or, um, flea beetles or it's more of a management tool? It's a good manage. It's another management tool. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, are there any reports that you know of on the bene on attracting beneficials um, with uh, with trap crops? I'm not sure. I um, e organics okay. might have. Do you do you know? <laughs> well, I'm trying to think. Um, Let's see, I, I know we have some articles on attracting beneficials um, on our website. Um, definitely check us out um, at uh, extension.org slash organic underscore production. I'm just gonna quickly type that link into the chat box in case you're not familiar with our resources. Because if you look through our website, um, we really do have a huge number of resources, um, articles, webinars, and videos. Um, so I'm just putting that again in the chat box. And then someone commented um, that Larry Zinder has one on farmscaping. In fact, we do have several farmscaping articles and webinars in our archive. So I would encourage you um, to browse through our site. Um, if you look at the organic um, agriculture pages and if you look under pest control or insect management, um, you should find quite a lot of informative articles and then our webinar archive also has um, quite a bit as well. So um, we're, let's see, we're pretty much out of time here. Um, so I would really like to thank everyone for this great discussion and thank Joyce for um, answering all these questions. And um, I'd like to encourage everyone to attend future webinars on insect management and also ask you if you could fill out the follow-up survey that you'll be receiving in an email later today. So thanks again, Joyce, for presenting the results of your research. And thanks to everyone for joining us. Uh, yes, thank you all. Yeah.